today my talk is going to be about the Bisley Silver Man. talking about the Visley Silver Man. A few years ago, some fine members of the Lapis community, who were currently wearing yellow and purple, asked me what I knew about the Visley Silver Man, and they'd gone to look for one of the locations where this supposed alien creature had been spotted. They couldn't find it, and I knew where it was. And it's only taken two years to research the rest of it to find out what the story was. The other interesting thing about the Visley Silver Man it took place less than four miles away from here. In fact, it is just 3.4 miles down Down Lane. So if you fancy walking there at some point, you just simply go straight past the um, Black Swan, keep on walking until the road runs out, keep on walking until the path runs out, <coughs> fly over a fence and walk through a business park and you're there. Now, what is the Risley Silver Man? Now, if you've never heard the story, I shall tell you all about it. It takes place on the 17th of March, 1978, St. Patrick's Day, when an engineer, going by the name of Ken Edwards, was driving home following a union meeting that had been held in Salem. He was so shocked by what he saw that he went straight, well, the Guardian found out, the Morton Guardian, the old newspaper found out, and ran this front page story the week after. Now, in his story, it basically the Risley monster terrifies driver. It doesn't go into much detail, it simply tells you that he saw a seven foot tall silver figure. That's a silver coloured <coughs> oiler suit wearing figure with dark headgear. And the sighting took place after midnight. So it's most likely Saturday morning. The time given was 12.30. So the exact details of the sighting, as they called by Ken and generally found online, uh, seem to be called from a book from uh, Jenny Bamble's, with a few bits of additions that seem to have been added over the years. And mainly you can find it online now. Um, I think it's Mysterious Universe, that's got the easiest to find version of it. Now going off uh, their account of it, it suggests that late on the 17th of March 1978, an engineer by the name of Ken Edwards was driving back from a union meeting along Dayton Road. At 11.30 he headed down Dayton Road and he was surprised to see a seven foot tall silver covered figure walking down the slope towards the road he was driving along. He moved in a very stiff legged way. It worked in such a way that it appeared that it had no knee joints. And it was often thought that it was simply some kind of alien creature, maybe some kind of robot. Something that's anatomy didn't match what we find on Earth. Now, as Ken sees his figure coming down the side of an embankment towards him, he stops his car. He's startled to see a silver man not only staggers down this embankment at an impossible angle, but he starts to walk across the road, stops and turns and looks at Ken in his car. Ken supposedly feels the weight of something pressing down on his shoulders, forcing him into his seat. The figure possibly shines beams of light towards him, almost like laser beams shooting out from his eyes, or in America we described them as being more like the Omega beams of Dark Side, a cartoon character who finds Superman. And wherever it was, these beams <coughs> seem to have been put some kind of pressure onto it. The silver man 
carried on walking across the road, reaching the perimeter fence. Now the perimeter fence was a fence round a secret nuclear establishment. It was the UK Atomic Agency site of Italy, where they may have been working on nuclear weapons, or they may have just been working on secret nuclear projects for civil nuclear. However, the site was surrounded by described as a 10-foot wire-topped fence. The thing that was startling about the silver man is as he walks towards the fence, he simply lifts his hand and walks through the wire. He melts through the wire. The wire is still intact. He's just simply gone through it. As you can imagine by now, Kenny's a bit worried. <laughs> so, he faces off home. Once he gets home, first thing he does, gets a big whiskey, knocks back a drink, like any serious researcher should. It takes him about an hour after that, before he suddenly thinks, I've just seen a strange creature walk into a top secret location. Perhaps I should tell someone. <laughs> so, he gets his wife to drive him down to the local police station, Padgate, which is around two miles away from where he decided to take place. His wife is driving because by now he's a bit too drunk to drive. He gets to the police station and he tells them what he's seen. How this may have been uh, come across when he tells them I've seen a seven foot tall silver man and the wife's had to drive me here because I can't stand. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> However, they do take it seriously and they go back to the location. When they get there, they find the nuclear constabulary already there, walking down Dayton Road. Now Dayton Road runs alongside the nuclear establishment, on one side with lots of big signs saying keep out, don't walk, and on the other side is waste ground. These policemen shine the torches around, look at the fence, see it's still intact, look at the waste ground and decide we don't need to go look any further. And that is roughly the story of the site. Ken would later recall he believes he's lost an hour of time. This may suggest that there was some kind of time slip, that something about the encounter altered time. Of course, it could just simply be a discrepancy in the time, because we've already got one report saying it was half past 12, another report suggests it's half past 11. Different variations on it. So, what we have here is the sketch of what is widely shown as being the creature that Ken Edwards saw. So, it's a large figure, it's seven foot tall, so it's even considerably taller than me. It looks peculiar. <coughs> the arms alone make it look very peculiar. These arms don't come out of where normal arms come out of. I've heard them described as nipple arms. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird looking creature. If you could imagine this in bright silver staggering down the hill. Now, the embankment, the description suggests it's a steep embankment. And it was odd because when he walked down the embankment, it leant forward at such an angle that it should have toppled over. It was a mystery how he could have done this. But the more research we did, we noticed a few changes. This is actually Ken Edwards' version of what he saw. Now, if you look at this, we notice there's some differences. The arms. The arms, it has to be said, do appear on the shoulders. Going upwards, and then back down. But they are more like arms. Again, we have roughly the same kind of image. But it does seem to have a waist now, but it didn't have before. But whatever it was, it was still seven foot tall, bright silver, and weird and still capable of walking through a fence. So that's not particularly easy to see, but that's kind of Ken's appearance in the 
quote to Guardian. And in the world quote to Guardian, it simply says, Visual monster terrifies driver. And it goes on about this terrifying monster. It does not mention anywhere a UFO. It does not mention anything to do with aliens. It is simply a silver monster. It does make you wonder if Wellington also had different shades of monster that walks around the place. <laughs> this was a silver man. Whether we have the slightly grey man, the iffy blue man, we don't know. But what we do know, my page will turn on. What we do know is that Wellington was not afraid of looking at a subject of UFOs. In fact, the Wellington Guardian that year had an article about a UFO nearly every week. <laughs> the actual day that he had his sighting had a full page of UFOs. A local UFO investigator had just shown someone his 5,000 uh, records. We had a letter from the Aphorius Society suggesting that a sighting a week before had simply been one of their masters flying by. We had somebody else writing a letter into the Wellington Guardian the, the week after, suggesting that if he'd been part of the Royal Observatory Corps, why had he not seen any UFOs during the war? We had somebody else writing a few weeks after it, describing how they'd seen UFOs flying over Wellington and thought they were heading towards Risley. However, the sighting took place at 3 o'clock in the morning and was at a distance of over 6 miles away. Even today, it's hard to find where Risley is just by looking out because there's almost nothing to show where the place is. <coughs> but what we can see is, if there was a suspicion that it was a UFO that had dropped off a silver man, We'd have thought it had been mentioned in the paper at the time. So what exactly did Ken see? Now he's been lots of different ideas of what he could have possibly seen. And these are just sort of called together in various places. It be books, magazines, the radio, and of course some dodgy websites. So the idea it was an extraterrestrial. This is based on. It's weird. It's seven foot tall, it walks in a way that's weird, it doesn't look to be of this earth. Well, if you're not from this earth, where could you be? Another earth, another planet, he's flown across, landed somewhere in the waste ground, and we're sneaking into the government site to find out what those humans were up to with nuclear stuff. He was going to find out what we're going to do to wipe ourselves off the planet. But there's no trace of any kind of craft. There's no sign of him climbing out of the solar disk. Absailing out of the UFO, nothing at all. There have been a number of occasions where <coughs> the claims to be sightings of UFOs over Risley, and these have been used to suggest that in the time nearby, people were actually seeing UFOs on the site. <coughs> However, looking into one of these sightings of a UFO by full use in the area, it turned out the sighting took place in 1969. That is a long time between a sighting of a UFO and a silver man walking past it. Possibly too long to suggest the two are actually related. A ghost? We don't know what ghosts are. There may be a ghost of a seven foot tall creature that haunts day to moon. There could be a reason why, and one of the suggestions was, at the time, Risley was a secret nuclear site, but previously, it had been a munitions factory, one of the largest in the country. By the time he sees a silver man, most of the munitions sites has been demolished. A chunk of it has been turned into the nuclear establishment. Well, West of Risley is about to be turned into what's now Birchwood. But at the time, Birchwood was only in the planning stages and they just started demolishing the old munitions plant and relaying down a new town, going to Newtown. They'd also started to build a motorway. And <laughs> the motorway cuts through the back of Risley, straight over the church. 
And one theory is that simply the motorway flattened the church, went through the graveyard, and perhaps caused some kind of disturbance. And this phantom has come from the graveyard and is basically storming around the area trying to scare people. A bit like Scooby Doo. <laughs> the graveyard does exist and it's got about five graves in it now. And it really is cut off by the motorway. There's a row of houses, a small triangle at the ground, a few gravestones, and a shoulder, lanes of traffic. Only problem is, it's not actually close to the location of the site. It's on the other side of Risley. Another idea has been suggested, it's an interdimensional visitor. Again, we're looking at something not of this world. And really the idea of looking at this interdimensional is that its ability to walk through the fence. Now this is one thing that sets this science in a path from many others. It's the, the ability to both look at a substantial, solid figure match with the ability to simply walk through a chain link fence. A skill that not many people have mastered yet. Is that because there's something about it that isn't fully of this planet? Is it something that's not really of this plane? Is it just simply something that can alter its density? Simply because it isn't really here. And then come back into, drift back into the world on the other side of the fence. Is the idea of some kind of thought, thought, thought? Is it some kind of uh, topper that simply something was created in a building across the road from where it was sighted that appeared to be carrying out some kind of experimentation into sleep deprivation, according to some reports? Had something climbed out of somebody's mind and ran across the road and poor Mr. Edwards had seen it as he was in the past? Another suggestion, it was simply a fireman in a radiation suit. And um, because the area dealt with um, nuclear, there was a possibility that somebody had, uh, if it had been a leak, and he'd gone out in a protection suit to go, on to go to look and maybe some incident. And it just seemed nothing more than a bloke in a protection suit walking across the road. But then, that doesn't solve the problem of how he walked through a fence. Radiation suits can do many things. They might be able to protect you from radiation, but they don't make it substantial enough to walk through a fence. So again, this was discounted by most researchers as not being the case. Now this is a map I found online of the sighting based on Ken's account. Now, as you can see on that, we've got Dayton Road is where the little band symbol is. It come off the M62. Now, when it come off the M62, it had only just been built, and there wasn't actually a turn off the Birchwood at the time, and it turned down what seemed to be some kind of access road, possibly for works vehicles coming on and off the motorway. It then travels down Dayton Road. Now, on Dayton Road, there is one side, a reactor. It was the university's research reactor. Tiny little nuclear reactor, an Argonaut reactor. Across the road from the reactor was the fire station. Alongside the fire station was an embankment which was topped with the security fence, which is a 10 foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire on the top. And then we've got the atomic energy plant, I think he says, but he, the only reactor was actually on the, uh, the university's one about waste ground, and it was waste ground. It was a vast area of derelict buildings, consisting in the Second World War of basically bunker after bunker for storing munitions and factories that by then had been deserted for nearly 30 years and were currently being demolished. If you can think back to, say, a 1970s Doctor Who, where we're going through some kind of dark ridden world that's been destroyed. That's the kind of area. Everything has been flattened. Everything is just shrubs. It's utterly awful. But the problem is with the map, it doesn't actually map 
match anything today. The whole area has been massively the developed. Now, you can actually see it's the Silver Man on Dayton Road, which might the happen there if you can actually see it. And Dayton Road isn't actually that far <coughs> inland, and it goes between two roundabouts. <coughs> And this area here is where the nuclear site used to be. Somewhere up here is where the silver man appeared. So what I was trying to do was try to find the details of silver man just to find its exact location where we'd actually seen the site had taken place. To do that, you really need to find a map. The landscape has changed so much it's very difficult to match them up. The other problem was, because it was a secret nuclear site, nobody actually took any photos of it. Now as an example of just how, much, how difficult it is to find any footage or photos of the uh, atomic agency sites at Bisley. The business bank that it is now attempted last year to get photos for a project we were doing, and they only managed to get about six photos in its entire length as the Atomic Agency. And of most of those photos, they were staged against a building with a set of new graduates, and it was simply a group of people stood in a position so you couldn't actually see what was going on on site. Because nobody had phones that you could carry in your pocket with a camera, there's no photos of it. If it was today, I can guarantee there'd be endless photos of all the top secret stuff, nuclear, power plants, alien landing craft, you name it, but I'll put those on. So what I had to do was go back and look at any aerial photos of the fact that allows me to match up areas. Now one photo found was from 1968, and it shows it's still quite a large, wide open area. Dayton Road is roughly there. That white building there is the the actor beats all the secret nuclear research facility buildings. Now this is a photo from 1973. Now this shows just how devilish the entire area is. If I can just get my bearings on the map, I think it's that road he travelled down. Devil's bunkers. Today, the town of Birchwood sits on it. So it's a town of around 11,000 people who now live on top of this old um, filling station for munitions. And today, there's very little of it that can still be seen. <coughs> this is an Ordnance Survey map from 1974. The Ordnance Survey map isn't quite up to date at this point because there's already empty houses there. We're just not on the map. The Atomic Agency, the UK, had their offices there. Now I've been told that if somebody was ill and we needed an ambulance, it was virtually impossible for the ambulance to find its way there because none of the maps actually showed the location. It was that top secret or simply the maps weren't up to date. Now, this map, from 1947, actually gives more information than any other map I've found. And it's simply because somebody mapped on it all the existing buildings today. Because of the existing buildings being shown in red, it's actually these three buildings match up with buildings that exist today. Not only do we match up with buildings that exist today, we match up with this rather nice map for staff orientation from the UK site. Considering nobody actually managed to take any photos of the inside of the place, it is remarkable that somebody who managed to take the map up one day and left it lying about to be scanned many years later. And it actually shows the entire site. These are the three buildings that showed up on the earlier 1947 map. This is Dayton Road, 
That is the research reactor. That is some kind of isolation unit. This building is the fire station. So the fire station isn't actually opposite the reactor. It's actually more towards this building. Now, we're nearly all of that on that map now. It's actually been demolished as well. But it does allow us to compare the two maps. And from there, we can roughly work out where the location of sites and actually took place. So, looking at the distances, we can see Ken's got the Spence Line corner, and the corner is actually just at the far right. We can see it's roughly sighted somewhere around there. And the actors are, the isolation buildings are, the fire stations are. The perimeter fence runs along here, and it's the second perimeter fence runs along here. So what I was able to do anyway was go along to the site and see what's still there today to see if there's any clues to what you could possibly see. <coughs> now at the edge of the site, and a bit of land is currently being redeveloped, is part of the original security fencing. Now, I'm not convinced it's actually 10 foot tall. It looks to be more than 8 foot tall, possibly with another foot or so about by it, but it has seen better days. This bit of wire is actually across a bit of waste ground that is being redeveloped. Since these photos were taken last year, the whole area has been ripped up and will soon be a set of industrial buildings. But I did actually find that corner post that appears on Ken's map. And that's a little bit of a decent bow you can see in the background. of trying to find out what the silver man could have been looking at. One of the buildings of course mentioned was the reactor, so we managed to find a photo of it. And this was the building that was on one side of uh, Ken's map. And this is supposedly where the silver man came from, this kind of area. And that's a tiny uh, little line of the actor. The university used to play with nuclear activity. <laughs> Now across the road from the reactor, through those trees you can just make out that something was called Downing House today. And that's one of the original 1940s buildings that's still on the site. But because we know that building has been there since the 1940s, we also know it could never have been the fire station. So we knew the fire station had to be in a different position. So today, that office building behind the trees is roughly where the reactor was. That's a slightly better view of it. And that's across the Eaton Road. And like I say, all signed of the reactor's gone. It was de de I think it was decommissioned in the 1980s and finally removed in the early 2000s. <coughs> now, between those trees is where the fire station was the second point of its uh, sighting. And that's another view of it. As you can see, time has not been kind to that fire station. It's a little more than a, uh, a spot of uh, tarmac and some uh, very loose turf. But we can look, uh, if we open the book, we can just roughly work out the locations today from the buildings that have, that have changed. So that was roughly the reactor, that was roughly the isolation building, this block here, that was roughly the fire station, that's your fence line, and that's Dayton Road. So Ken's come along this road, and roughly at this point you see something cross from here onto this area. And so this was your, your top secret location where no one was supposed to be uh, able to see what what was going on, or what was being done. <coughs> so, from working out the locations based on the maps, 
the courts to decide, the hard courts to decide, but the civil demand is simply to be somewhere there, next to the lay line. And what's across the road that way? So this is where the where the civil demand would cross the road there, and you miss one. And that's data to go from roughly the angle that uh, Ken would have seen it. As you can imagine, it is actually, despite the pictures, quite a busy road. I never found the time to stand in the middle of it and take a picture from Ken's position. Otherwise, it would be slightly different. Now, that's looking from inside the former UK site. And basically, Ken would have been up here. And again, that's the... Uh, a closer viewer. Now, while doing the research into what uh, was spotted, I was able to find somebody who used to work at the site, so they would give me some more information of what happened. So this is the uh, area of your location. That would have been the isolation building. And those two trucks are basically back to where they would have stopped. So this is another map I managed to find, actually showing the buildings in place. And I've mapped both the, the two important buildings in this story. There's the isolation building and the fire station. As you can see, you've got the your earth embankments and the silver man's supposed to walk up and down and around. So that leads us to what the, uh, the person who was telling me who was working on the site. Now, we've got to go back. Back to the time of Kenny's site. At the time of Kenny's site, if anybody was hanging around outside that fence line, they were more likely to be chased off by the, uh, the police force on site. Because the site was a secret nuclear location, it also had its own uh, fire brigade, its police force, it was a self contained unit. Now, what exactly was going on the site, happening on the site, wasn't quite as mysterious as made out. It appears to be more to do with designing new nuclear power stations. One of the things they were designing was a cooling system. They used liquid metallic sodium as a coolant. Now, on some of the older maps of the site, there are a couple of large towers, and these were used to mimic the reactor of a nuclear power station. And the idea was to test this coolant system to see if it could be used successfully in a <coughs> nuclear power station. Now, I believe this type of coolant was actually used to do rain eventually. But the thing is about these coolants and using uh, the metallic sodium is simply, if it catches fire, it burns at a very high temperature. As such, the fire brigade on the site were issued with high temperature firefighting suits. These are silver suits. These are very stiff silver <coughs> suits. These suits would go over the normal firefighting tunic. By the time we got over it, the person would find it very difficult to move. It's very restrictive, you'd have trouble bending arms, legs. We're not designed, the comfort we're designed to stop you turning into a toasty. Now, one of the things about the site, Rob, the fireman in the fire station did like a joke. Now, one of the tricks he used to do was set up the fire hoses and spray over the fire building onto Dayton Road to give the impression it was local rain. Another thing we like to do was wind people up. Now, one of the reasons it's been suggested this isn't a hoax is who would have known to wait for Ken Edwards to go driving along that road at 6 o'clock at night? Who would have been better waiting? No one. No one's going to 
going to stand there and sew the suit thinking someone will be along in a few minutes. No. The object of the joke wasn't Ken. It turns out, early on the morning of the 18th, sometime after midnight, we decided for a prank. There was one fireman who I've been told was called John. He was over <laughs> six foot five in height. This is simply based on the idea of the witness who was telling me, who was comparing how big I was to him. He put on his high temperature fire suit and decided to scare somebody in the isolation chamber, the isolation building across the road. What we'd heard was that people were being kept in there, isolated. So we decided to cross the road, go up the embankment, and tap on the windows to try and scare someone. So he staggers up the, the embankment with his nice big fire time suit, gets to the window, hammers on the window, and gets no response. He then turns around and starts walking back. Imagine his surprise he gets halfway across the road when he gets caught in the head headlights of a car facing towards him. He stops, he freezes, he turns round and looks. Uh, turns out to be Mr. Edwards in his car. He was under the impression, also I've been told, that Mr. Edwards was a bit worse for drink. Now, we have to think. Ken Edwards has been to a union meeting. He's already come home from work. He's gone back out to a union meeting. He's saying, it's 1978. It's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> How many people have been to a union meeting? How many people have been to a union meeting in this room where nobody's had a drink? How many people have been to a union meeting where most people can't stand? Has anyone been to a union meeting on St. Patrick's Day? They probably drank Guinness and couldn't stand. He decides, hanging around on the road watching this vlog in the car is a good idea. So he sets off back towards the fire station. And here's the secret of how he got through the fence. He does what the best of us do. He went through the gate. <laughs> You can just make out the gate box. That's an original gate box. And you can just see there's one box there and one box here. So all that happened, in the bottom of this fire suit, one more became, left it slightly adrift, wandered across the road, came back, lifted his arm, pushed the gate open, walked through, Ken drives off. Locks the gate behind him. Gets out of his suit. By the time Ken comes back, no doubt the firemen are doing something useful. Certainly nothing to do with fire suits. Nobody has a clue what's gone on. Now this is actually the only surviving gates from the time, and you can see how they are big, wire-topped. While they look quite obvious to see, in this next picture, which obviously is not the best, on the left hand side there's a chain link fence. You cannot see where one blends into the other. On a very badly lit day to road, late at night, when you've just had this fright of your life, can we blame Ken Edwards for not noticing who was a gate? And I don't think we can. I think in good faith he honestly thought he had seen a creature from another world, a monster. And nobody at our fire station is going to admit it when the police came around later. Is that what uh, Ken Edwards saw coming towards him? A silver man? Well, these are the different versions we've got. We've got a modern high temperature fire suit. Doesn't particularly look like it. We've got a 1967 version, but I'll be honest, it's a 1967 action man fire rescue 
silver suit. Because you had an idea how expensive silver suits are to buy. They're astronomical. This one was on eBay, less than 20 quid. But it does give you an idea of how bizarre it looks. So this was just a shot of one taken in the dark. And you can see, when it's illuminated, how the arms and the shadow, the altar, the positions look very odd. And there he is, stood on top of it. You also notice just how reflective these suits are when the light's shining on them. Is it possible that the beams of light that can be both seen coming from this, the creature was simply the light being reflected back at him with his own car headlines? And in case you don't believe me, he isn't a real Superman, he really is a tiny little fan. There he is, the mother of You'll be glad to know, he's also a backup fighter tonight, because he's got no further use for him. <laughs>